Thanks very much, Chris. Thanks to all the organizers for putting on such an excellent show today and, um, and for inviting me, obviously, and thanks to you all for coming. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm going to talk about this. Obviously, I've only got 18 minutes, which isn't very long, but I'll do my best to tell you broadly what we do and why. Um, and I hope I'm going to be able to convince you that those of you in the audience, all of you youngsters who are like half my age, uh, um, have a fair chance of benefiting from all of this. In fact, even I have a fair chance of benefiting. Um, so yeah, this is what we do, as you've just heard. Um, our Sense Foundation is based in California, but we have a subsidiary over here. And we're interested in applying regenerative medicine to aging. So most of what I'm going to tell you today is about what that means and why it's likely to work. But ultimately, I want to tell you why we're doing this in the first place. <laughs> right? um, you know, I mean, I, I have to spend an incredible amount of my time trying to persuade people that it would be a good idea if we could bring uh, aging under you know, proper medical control, because there is an extraordinary amount of resistance to that concept out there. You know, people make up the most unbelievably stupid reasons why this shouldn't be done. Um, and let's face it, it is unequivocally humanity's worst problem. This is a way of uh, you know, verifying that, in case you had any doubt. Um, of course, loads of people, I, I, hands up if you want to get Alzheimer's disease. Uh, hands up if there's some age in the future at which you think you will want to get Alzheimer's disease. Yeah, that was easy, wasn't it? All right, and cancer and so on. Right. So, um, so the, the key thing about these diseases is most people like to think of them as somehow distinct from aging itself. Um, you know, and that's why they'll be able to think that aging is what they want to die of. You know, in other words, they want to avoid all of these diseases and just you know, die peacefully in their sleep, having had a nice good in in innings. But that's bollocks, because the, these, the reason these diseases are age-related, there can, in, you know, even in theory, only be one reason why an age-related disease predominantly affects people who were born a long time ago. Namely, that these diseases are aspects of the later stages of something that goes on throughout life. And of course, that is aging. Um, so, ultimately, you've got to include all those diseases as part of the thing that we would be fixing when we fix aging. Um, and that means that roughly two-thirds of all deaths worldwide are down to aging. And, of course, in the industrialized world, it's something like 90%, because not so many people die of malaria and such like. So why do people actually defend aging? Why do people actually have any kind of hesitation about this? Why is there so little effort being made to try to really develop medical therapies that actually combat aging itself, rather than simply combating the symptoms of aging, which has obviously not been terribly successful. Um, I put it down to this. I call it rational denial. Basically, everyone knows aging is absolutely ghastly, but they've spent the last, you know, since the dawn of civilization, knowing that aging was impossible, trying to do something about it and failing and trying again and failing, and, you know, we've come to terms with it. We've resigned ourselves and made our peace with aging. And, you know, once you've done that, once you've given up trying to do something about something that's so horrible, um, it's very miserable trying to get people to, you know, to, to re-engage the battle. It's better to, um, uh, for most people to just put it out of their minds by making up crazy reasons to trick themselves into thinking that aging is a good idea after all. Um, and you know, so people will say things like, oh dear, dictators would live forever, or how would we pay the pensions? You know, as if those really were more important and more challenging problems than the problem of getting Alzheimer's disease and dying. You know. <coughs> Anyway, so um, the point is, I have a good deal of sympathy with this right up until this stopped being true. Right up until it becomes possible that we may be within striking distance of actually doing something about aging. So what I've come today to tell you is that we are within striking distance now. Okay, so I said this. So what are these two terms that I highlighted in red? You probably have a fair idea in your own mind what they mean, but I want to give you a relatively precise definition of each of them. First of all, what's regenerative medicine? It's not just stem cell therapy and tissue engineering, the two like, you know, highlight um, fields within regenerative medicine. This is what it is. Anything that restores the structure of a tissue or an organ to how it was before it suffered damage. And the damage need not necessarily be something like spinal cord injury, the sort of thing that is treated these days a lot with regenerative medicine. It could be gradual accumulating damage, which is what aging is. Similarly, the Structural restoration may not be at the whole organ level, like tissue engineering. It may also not be at the um, cellular level, like stem cell therapies. It may be at the molecular level, inside cells, or in the spaces between cells. And that turns out to be rather important when we discuss aging. What is aging? 
There's a million definitions of aging. Most of them are uncontroversial, but useless. In other words, they don't help us to orient our thoughts with regard to what to do about aging. This definition I like because it does help us to orient our thoughts. What I'm saying here is, first of all, aging is a side effect of being alive in the first place. In other words, metabolism, which is the word that biologists use to encompass everything that goes on in the body, all the molecular and cellular and systemic processes that keep us going from one day to the next, eventually causes pathology, the decline in function of metabolism, the emergence and progression of age-related diseases. So you do that. That's, that's the easy part of this definition. The other part, which is absolutely critical for all of you to understand, is I'm introducing this word damage. What I'm saying here is there's a particular means by which metabolism causes pathology. How it does it is by, throughout life, even starting before we're born, creating a variety of different types of molecular and cellular side effects that accumulate in the body because they're not repaired and eventually become abundant enough to get in the way of metabolism and cause the pathologies of old age. So damage is the set of intermediates between metabolism and pathology. And it's only because of those intermediates that we actually have this linkage between being alive and being dead. Now, I told you that was going to be useful because of how we can think about intervention in the context of that definition. And here's what I meant. Here's what I just said down here. Metabolism causes damage, causes pathology. There's basically two themes out there that have been traditionally considered for postponing the pathology of old age. One of them is this. I'm going to call it the geriatrics approach. And it covers pretty much everything that we have today in terms of medicine for old age diseases. Essentially what it says is, let's try and attack the pathologies of old age just in the same way that we would attack any other disease and try and you know, alleviate the symptoms and slow it down. But it's a losing battle basically because of this here. The damage is continuing to accumulate. Remember that was part of my definition of damage which means that intrinsically, by definition, the geriatrician's job is getting harder and harder as the patient gets older. And so, lo and behold, it doesn't work very well. Um, and, you know, this is, you don't need to be a biologist to know this, right? Um, an awful lot of things go wrong. They exacerbate each other. It's a losing battle, a downward spiral. The other approach here is to be more preventative, to say, well, okay, maybe prevention is better than cure. Maybe if we try and clean up metabolism, we'll do better try and slow down the rate at which it creates these various types of damage in the first place. And that way, of course, we'll have the same effect. We'll postpone the age at which the damage becomes pathogenic. Sounds good. But unfortunately, it's got a problem too. Here it is. Metabolism is rather complicated. This is a simplified diagram of a small subset of what we know about how metabolism works. And that's bad enough. But the real problem is that this is a simplified diagram of a small subset of what we know about how metabolism works, which is completely dwarfed, as any biologist will tell you, by the astronomical amount that we don't know about how metabolism works, even ignoring the stuff that we don't even know that we don't know. So, um, <laughs> so, so it, 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 it's hopeless. It's, it, this is not broken in principle as a way of postponing aging, the way the, geri the geriatrics approach is, but it's an idea whose time has emphatically not come. So how can we do better? Well, I'm going to talk about cars for a little while. Um, because one thing we've got to remember is that the human body is a machine. It's a really viciously complicated machine, but it's still a machine, which means that we might be able to figure out how to sustain it in full functioning order beyond what we might call its warranty period, how it was designed to, um, uh, to last, um, by using the same tricks that we use today already with simple man-made machines to extend their life beyond their warranty period. So here's a car that... Um, you know, it's 50 years old, more than 50 years old, and it's doing all right. It's doing all right because it was built that way. It's got corrosion-resistant metal and tough tires and all that, and that's the same sort of reason why the human body lasts much longer than the body of a dog or a mouse. It's just been built so that it's going to last longer in the first place. So it's got a long warranty period. But this is a car that was built in the same year as the one on the previous slide, and it was not built to last. And yet, it's doing just as well as the other one. The reason is because it's got style, it's owners fell in love with it, they've done an unusually comprehensive amount of maintenance on it over the years, and that has worked. So what this tells us is that maintenance is, if you do it comprehensively enough, a truly effective way of keeping a machine going. What does that mean when we go back to aging? It means this. It means there's a third completely different paradigm that we need to look at. I call it the maintenance approach. 
Essentially, it says, rather than trying to slow down this process whereby damage causes pathology, or this process whereby metabolism creates damage in the first place, we instead try to uncouple those two processes from each other by periodically going in and repairing the damage so that it never gets to the level of abundance that causes the pathologies, even though metabolism is still creating the damage. And it's really promising. Because per first of all, it's preemptive enough that it doesn't have this problem of the downward spiral of, of the geriatrics approach, because the damage, by definition, does not have any accumulating precursors the way the pathology does. But secondly, it comes in outside the, um, the realm of metabolism. We don't have to understand very much about how damage is created, in other words, what the metabolic processes are that are creating it, in order to fix it. All we need to do is characterize the damage itself. So we're essentially sidestepping a vast amount of ignorance, which is very handy. And it turns out that it really is true that um, this is a simpler approach. Metabolism, as I showed you, is viciously complicated, so is pathology. The damage in the middle is not. Here's my claim. All of the phenomena that qualify as damage, by the definition I'm using today, these intermediates, can be classified into one or another of these seven major categories. And here, as you can see, these are proper, you know, concrete biological phenomena. I mean, I'm using quite colloquial language here, but you see what I mean. Junk inside cells simply means molecular byproducts of normal, essential metabolic processes that, for whatever reason, the cell does not have the machinery either to break down or to excrete. So instead, it sequesters them. And eventually, it's like, you know, not taking the garbage out of your house for a month. Oh, I'm sorry, you're all students. I meant not taking out the garbage out of your house for a year. Right. Um, <laughs> um, um, OK, so, um, so, so, I mean, you can go down the list. You know, junk outside cells, of course, in the spaces between cells, same, same sort of deal. Too few cells, cells dying and not being automatically replaced by the division of other cells. You know, so eventually you get too few cells. And you can point to particular aspects of aging that are caused by each of these things. So cardiovascular disease comes, is basically caused by number one. Alzheimer's disease is certainly partly caused by number two. Parkinson's disease, number three, and so on. Why is this a complete list? A couple of reasons. First of all, it looks like a complete list if you think, what is the body made of? You know, we're made of cells and stuff between cells, what, is, what are cells made of? You can just look at where the structures are that are long-lived enough to be able to accumulate damage. Second one is this. It's been the same list for almost 30 years. You know, you'd think we'd have extended the list if there were much extending to do in that sort of time. But here's the really good news. We have a fair idea how to fix all of these things. So here's the same list in slightly different language and in a different order on the left. On the right is the list of ways that we can not just slow down the accumulation of these types of damage, but actually reverse it. In other words, repair the damage. So you all know that stem cell therapy is precisely that in the case of cell loss. When you've got too few of a particular type of cell because the body is not automatically making more, you can, make, you, can, you can give the body more by putting in stem cells that do the job instead. And we, if we go down this list, which I don't have time to do today, it's the same sort of deal. It's just looking at the damage itself, not paying too much attention to how the damage is created, looking at what the damage is and how we might, with minimal to none in terms of intervention and manipulation of metabolism itself, just go in and reverse the situation, restore the structure, so that we will automatically thereby restore the function. So what does this mean? Well, you may have noticed that I've been talking about health. I don't work on longevity. A lot of people think I do, but I don't. I work on health. I work on stopping people from getting sick. And I think it's absolutely essential for everybody, especially everybody who has any you know, reservations about the consequences for the humanity if we didn't have aging, to remember this. This is not about keeping people alive in a frail state for a longer time than what they are at the moment. This is about keeping them healthy. And any longevity benefits that we have as a result will be a side effect, a side benefit, a consequence of keeping people healthy. So if you don't want Alzheimer's, then you do want this even if it means that you're going to be living longer than you have thought about living. But there's a couple of other things I want to point out about this. The first thing is that it's not going to be gradual. If we develop therapies that actually repair the damage of old age, rather than simply slowing down the accumulation, then there will come a tipping point where those therapies are comprehensive enough that we are fixing damage as fast as it's being created. In other words, we're saying one step ahead of the problem. Until we get to that point, we will only have relatively modest increases in healthy lifespan and thereby increases in total lifespan. 
current world record longevity is 122. I don't think we're going to get the first 150-year-old until we get to that tipping point. And that's only 30 years of increase. But once we do get to that tipping point, the sky's the limit. There is no reason for, to, to suppose there should be any limit on how long people can live, even if the subsequent improvements in the comprehensiveness of these therapies are relatively slow, relatively modest. So that's why we can make crazy statements like this. The first 150-year-old may be alive today. I think that they probably are. In fact, I think the first 150-year-old is probably an adult today. I don't know how old that person is going to be, though. I think there's a 50% chance that we will develop that, if you like, the first generation tipping point regenerative medicine within the next 25 years or so. But I think there's at least a 10% chance that we won't get there for 100 years if we hit you know, obstacles that we haven't thought of. So that's an extremely speculative time frame, rather as pretty much every prediction is that's more than a couple of years away in terms of future technology. But we can make a much more confident statement about how things are going to be after that tipping point. Um, some of you probably have heard that I um, coined a phrase longevity escape velocity several years ago to describe where we would be in this. And that's sort of the point. You know, if you chuck a projectile up in the air at a certain speed, it gets to a certain height. If you chuck it a bit harder, it goes a bit higher, and a bit higher, it goes a bit higher. But there comes a particular speed that you can chuck it at, beyond which it goes infinitely higher, it just never comes back. And it's going to be exactly the same for regenerative medicine against aging. So that's something to be thinking about if you're trying to think how long people are going to live. But the question then is, what about that first stage that I've said is so speculative? Now, one thing that I often find when I talk to people of different ages about this work is that it's people around my age, around their 40s or 50s, that are most interested. Because people who are in their 70s or 80s, they say, well, sounds interesting, but it's not going to be in time for me, is it? So why should I care? You know, when I say, you've got kids, you know, and they say, yeah, well, I don't really care about my kids. Well, they don't quite say that. <laughs> they don't say that, but that's what they're thinking. Um, um, but conversely, people in their teens and 20s, painfully often, they'll say, yeah, well, sounds great, but, you know, it's going to be done before, um, before I need it, so I'll do something else with my life that's more, that's more urgent. And that's complete bollocks because there's a very good chance, I mean a significant chance, that it won't be in time for you unless we all do as much as we can to speed it up. Plus also, you know, 100,000 people a day, remember, that's what I told you, 30 World Trade Centers every day are dying of aging. And even if it's not you or lives that you save by speeding this up by a day or a year or whatever, it'll be somebody's lives and that's rather important. So this is the key thing I want to say in my last 20 seconds. The science is pretty much there. We know what we need to do. I've got a book out, actually, a few years ago. Write this. Go and get it. It's written for a general audience. Um, we've also got the scientists. The people who develop these background technologies that already exist, um, you know, they want to work on this. They think it's exciting. They're enthusiastic. What we don't have is the finances to make it happen. Where could those finances come from? They could come from philanthropy. That's where my foundation gets most of its money. And if there are any billionaires in the audience, then see me later, please. Um, but we could get it from government, if there were any votes in it. But there aren't, because so many bloody people pointing out that they shouldn't do this because they keep trying to cling to this rational denial I talked about earlier. So what you can do is advocacy. I mean, of course, if you're a biologist, work in the right field, if you're a journalist, you know, interview me and so on. But everyone can, everyone can do advocacy. Everybody can go out and persuade their family, their friends, their colleagues, that this really is humanity's worst problem and that the sooner we get on with it, the better. Thank you very much. <laughs>